we've assembled a great panel, and as your guided moderator, the unstoppable Robert Strand. I'm excited to be joined by three esteemed panelists. We have Jeremy Baines, president of Nesta US, Conrad Bergstrom, the CEO and founder of Exshore, and John Downey, who's president for the Americas with Hertegruten. And welcome, gentlemen. It's a Thank real you. privilege to, to, to be with you here. Um, if I could, before I ask a few questions, though, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, if, if each of you would kindly offer just a, a, a brief uh, introduction to yourself and your respective organization. And Jeremy, if I could, I'd, I'd like to start with you, please. Thank you, Robert, and it's a real honor to participate in the From Brand to Green panel discussion today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Baines. I'm the president of Nesta US, and I've had the pleasure of working for Nesta for nearly 20 years now. Neste is the third most sustainable company in the world, and we are the leading producer of renewable diesel. It's, uh, Neste has had quite a transformation over the just over 70 years history that we've had, starting off as a traditional oil refiner, but now in the last 15 years, 10 years, we have really transformed into a leader in the renewable space. Uh, to the point that just a couple of years ago, um, just until a couple of years ago, we were called Neste Oil, and we dropped the oil out of our brand name. We are now just Neste, liquid in Finnish. Um, and therefore, it's, it's a pleasure to participate in this panel today and uh, look forward to exchanging some interesting views with you all. That's great, Jeremy. Thank you so much. And Conrad, we'd love to hear. Please tell us just a little bit, something about yourself and your, your wonderful organization. Yeah, uh, my name is Conrad Bergstrom. I'm the president and founder of Exshore. Uh, we make 100% electric boats. So we are about to change the whole marine industry. If you could imagine sailing without wind, getting out on the sea without fumes, without noise and vibrations to a fraction of the cost of driving a boat because the water uh, has a density 784 times the air. So driving anything in the water takes a lot of energy. So the savings are bigger with the, with the boat. We uh, are working with three pillows uh, for our brand, and that's design, sustainability, and technology. Uh, and we aim to become the car manufacturer within the marine industry and Right now, the technology is quite expensive, but our mission is to scale and do volumes, so we will become the people's boat. The people's boat, that's got some good resonance to it. Um, John, I'd like to turn to you, and I just have to say as a fellow American, it's, it's a privilege to be engaged with you here in, in discussions of the Nordics. Um, so please, uh, John Downey, please. Uh, tell us a little bit something about yourself and, and Hertzegruten. Thanks, Robert. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is John Downey. Uh, I'm the president for Hertzegruten Americas. Uh, and if you don't know, Hertzegruten is the world's largest uh, expedition cruise firm. Um, we are also the greenest cruise firm in the world. And uh, if you don't know much about expedition cruising, um, you have to kind of forget what you know about cruising in general. Um, we have custom expedition built uh, ships that focus on uh, traveling to the corners of the earth. Um, we're the leading provider in Antarctica uh, for expedition cruises down there, but we also sail over the top of Canada, north of, <coughs> excuse me, north of Norway, um, down the Patagonian coast. And so we, for our 127 year history, have been the first to see the impacts of climate change in the Arctic and Antarctic waters. And uh, so we've decided um, over the last decade uh, to become the leading cruise provider uh, from a sustainability perspective. We're taking a number of measures across our entire fleet and all of our operations to uh, reduce the impact that we have on the environment. And eventually our goal is to become carbon neutral. Um, we have the world's first hybrid electric cruise ship. Um, it's the first of its kind. Uh, we actually have two of them now. We just launched our second one recently. Um, we are using biofuel uh, on the Norwegian coast. Uh, we're also incorporating liquid natural gas to reduce our emissions impact on the environment. And we're also making uh, changes to the operations, uh, operational side of our business um, to uh, reduce single-use plastic. We've actually eliminated it, and we're the first cruise firm to do so in the world. 
on board. Um, we also build in, uh, in the design of our ships, uh, a number of different measures to reduce our uh, fuel and, and electricity consumption over the course of our cruises. And so we're very, very proud of how we're contributing and leading in the sustainability uh, space from a cruise perspective. Uh, very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I'd actually like to, to, to come back uh, right to you, if I could, with the, with the first question. And I should say, first off, um, I had the privilege to live in Norway for a year as a Fulbright scholar and uh, am a big fan of, of Hurtigruten and I very much enjoyed it. Um, and so if I could start with you here and just you, you offer just a, a, a glimpse of the Hurtigruten story. Um, what's some guidance that you have uh, based upon your experiences with Hurtigruten and the experiences of Hurtigruten as large in trying to go from brown to green? Yeah, um, so we uh, we taken the approach that there are a multitude of technologies uh, to solve the sustainability problem. There's no one silver bullet to fixing this this situation, and uh, we're um, we have chosen to lead the way in the cruise industry. If you rewind a couple of years ago, uh, every other cruise firm said it was impossible to do a hybrid electric ship. It didn't exist. Obviously, automobiles existed in that front, but uh, but scaling up that type of technology and operations seemed impossible to the cruise industry at the time. We've chosen to innovate and actually take the lead ourselves instead of following. Um, and we've done that across our entire uh, the fleet as we've incorporated things like biofuels in, and uh, liquid natural gas. And we're choosing to make, take every possible step available to us and innovate where technology doesn't exist so that we can actually lead the industry. Many others are choosing to follow or not follow at all. Uh, they're blaming lack of infrastructure instead of taking the lead to develop that infrastructure. Last year we did uh, the world's largest biofuels contract uh, in the world. Um, and we chose to do that because we wanted to make sure the infrastructure was available on the Norwegian coast to uh, to support our ships. Um, so it's, it is about taking a stand and setting, uh, setting a flag of where you need to get to in the next couple of years and then continually moving that flag forward. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so incredibly proud to work for Hertzgruten uh, as a company, because we do believe this is important. It's both right for the world, but it's also uh, it's also right for business. And uh, and we get that now, and we're going to continue innovating in the future. John, thank you for that. And I think that that it, it serves Jeremy, if we could look to you and, and Nesta and, and your story. Uh, perhaps there are some parallels with some things that, that, that John has said here. And please, could you offer a bit of of guidance, perhaps some lessons from the Nesta story on going from brown to green. Yes, uh, with with pleasure. And I think one thing that uh, John mentioned really resonates with me is is that uh, the aspect that there is no one solution uh, to, to to climate change. And 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 to me, it's an indication that we will go to a polyfuel world where there are lots of different technologies and lots of different fuels available uh, to reduce carbon emissions. And that's that's one of the things that uh, Neste throughout its history has been doing. I mean, Neste being a Finnish company, uh, Nordic company, we've always been very conscious about uh, our place in society and our place in the environment. We've always looked at developing cleaner, higher performing fuels. And that's what led us really to this renewable diesel technology. Using waste cooking oils, uh, greases, animal fats, really from this brown to the green. So from the, the brown greases and real wastes to the, the green, renewable, green swan, if you want, of the industry. And, and I think that's, for, for me, that's the exciting part is that we, that we find ways of reusing the carbon that is in the atmosphere rather than pumping carbon out of the ground and then burning it and adding it to the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, so, so really we, we've on this journey of developing new and more sustainable fuels. And, um, the other thing that, that I think resonates with me is what John was saying is that the excuse. A lot of companies want to have an excuse not to do something. Yeah, but this technology exists today. Renewable fuels exist today, not only to power your, your cars, but it also a sustainable aviation fuel to power your planes. It exists for vessels. So the technology is there. It's just a choice whether you want to burn something sustainable 
or you'd want to continue to burn fossil fuels. So really excited to, to, to learn more about uh, John's journey with Hufti Gluten. That's great. And that brings us, uh, Conrad, to you. And, uh, you know, it, it might seem that Xshore, perhaps you have a little bit of a different story here as a company that started foundationally, arguably green. Uh, so could you offer some of your personal reflections on, on, on going green and any guidance that you may have for others? Sure. Um, I do believe that there will not be any sustainable, um, non, uh, I don't believe that any company who's not sustainable will survive and it's going to go quick. Uh, so everybody has to do this transaction. Um, I was just lucky that I could start a new company and, and go green directly in, to make this change. But of course, there is challenges also being new that the whole environment um, is not really ready. There is a lot of materials that is not sustainable that we have to use from a, a security perspective and safety. Uh, but there is so much uh, new uh, products coming to, uh, to the better. So, for example, we use cork material instead of uh, teak or plastics uh, on, on, the, on the decking. Now, it goes without saying, the world has changed uh, in very short order. Um, and I'd like to ask each of you, uh, and, and John, if I could start with, with, with you again here, um, what does this mean for your commitment to sustainability? So, John, what does it mean for Hurt Gruten's commitment to sustainability uh, facing the crisis that we're all part of today? Yeah, great question. Um, we, uh, so I don't think it changes, it doesn't uh, detract from the kind of our focus on sustainability and if anything, it pushes us forward. Um, while it, it does seem dire right now, uh, we are looking to the future. We're excited about um, restarting operations uh, both along the Norwegian coast and, and other locations around the world. and. If anything, it means we're going to double down on our focus on sustainability. Um, uh, people are looking to get outside. Uh, they are looking to experience the world again. And we think have, we have a huge opportunity to show them uh, not just um, these different parts of the world that are, that are very difficult to get to um, without, uh, without adventure cruise operations, but also um, do it in a way that educates them on, uh, on, on what's going on in the polar uh, caps and, and how climate change is affecting, uh, affecting the world. And we want to do it in a way that uh, both makes us proud, it educates the customer or the guest, and also uh, it convinces them to push further in making changes for, uh, for climate responsibility. And Jeremy, from a Nesta perspective, uh, how would you respond? Well, um, yes, we are tackling the COVID-19 crisis at the moment, but the, in, the climate change crisis has not gone away. Yesterday, for, for, one, for, for once in a very long time, uh, smog and, uh, has, has been blown away and we've got clean airs in large parts of the world. But that is unfortunately not going to stay once the economy starts roaring back. So, so we really have a choice to make at this point. Do we want to go back to business as usual and boom and bust cycles? Or do we want to have not only a sustainable recovery of the economy, but also to have a more sustainable way of powering our future? And I, um, I, th I think there's, there's, more, there's more choices to be made. I mean, personally, I drive an electric car. I need to drive 4.2 miles to get to work. So that works very easily. Um, I run, uh, the house runs on uh, green wind energy. So that, that is, that is a sustainable choice. But you have millions of heavy duty trucks on the road. And it's just not good enough to say that, oh, well, one day, maybe they can be electrified. They, these trucks are going to run for decades to come. We need to find a way of fueling them in a renewable and sustainable manner. And that technology exists today. There are biofuels out there. There's biodiesel, there's like uh, fuels like Neste produces renewable diesel that can reduce the emissions by up to 80% overnight. The only thing that you need to do is change the fuel. And the same thing goes for planes and the same thing goes for boats. That exists and now is really the time to make those choices. 
and Conrad, looking to you in the face of the current crisis, what does this mean uh, for Exxar? Well, um, I do believe that uh, it's not only bad, uh, it's also time to reflect uh, to, to uh, you know, um, when, when you work very hard, it, it, sometimes you need some time to, to actually come back and, and be in nature and, and, and do all that. So that has actually been a really good thing for me personally. Uh, for Exure, uh, we see that more and more, we have three different segments. One is business to consumers, and they are uh, making more green choices. And that is where we drive the trend. Then we have uh, the business to business which is like tax, water taxes, uh, hotels, and so on, that want to show the sustainable way and, and, and that they are aware and want to be on this trip to make the change so we all can survive. And then we have the business to governments. So we actually have increased our business since this happened. And, and um, I just pray for all the ones that uh, having a business that, uh, you know, um, haven't been able to 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 uh, uh, go through this because many have worked their whole life. This is not some financial guys fucked up. This is you know something that is really hitting all kind of places in in, in the society. So uh, we we need to come together and help each other to to get through this. But when we come out on the other side, I believe that we will be stronger and that we need to be more sustainable. Everyone. And John, I, I'd like to look to you again here because, of course, this is the Nordic Innovation Summit. Uh, and uh, as an American, I've drawn a lot of inspiration by looking at the Nordics and, and having experiences over the last almost two decades of comparisons between the, the Nordic context and the U.S. context. And I would be very interested to hear your reflections on any differences, similarities that you see uh, from your experiences in the U.S. and the Nordics, and specifically as it relates to ideas of innovation and sustainability, if you would. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, this is the first Norwegian company I've worked for. Um, but if you look at not just Norwegians, but Scandinavians and Scandinavians in general, they have been the first to experience the effects of climate change. Uh, Norway, um, if you're not familiar, set up the Seed Vault, um, which is a seed repository in a territory called Svalbard, and it's inside the Arctic Circle, but it's part of Norway, and it's it's uh, very far north. And uh, that was planning ahead. They they knew this was coming. There, there it was very obvious that we're going to be in a bad situation uh, this century. And uh, ironically enough, the Seed Vault actually flooded recently because uh, climate change is accelerating faster than everyone expected. Um, but we're starting to see the same types of types of things in, in the U.S. In Washington state, the glaciers on Rainier have receded at a monumental rate over the last 20 years. And um, and so I think people in the U.S. are starting to appreciate uh, the gravity of, of what's happening a little bit more. But um, I've working for the Norwegians has served in, as an inspiration. Um, and we are the first we have been the first cruise line to see the impact of our actions uh, in, in the Arctic waters. Um, and that's part of the reason why we lead the way we do in, in sustainability. And for us, it is 100% about making the right choices for the world. As Jeremy had mentioned, um, they're from a fuel perspective. Uh, we have chosen to take a higher cost fuel across our fleet. And we did that a decade ago. Every other cruise line and shipping line in the world can make that decision, but they've chosen not to because of cost. And so uh, it, it's the Norwegians have have really incorporated their experience from a climate change perspective and may take an active decision making to get us to the right place, at least where we can contribute to sustainability. That's great. Uh, John and, and uh, Jeremy, might you have any reflections on, on, on your perspectives of what, what this, what a, a Nordic innovation approach, a Nordic approach to sustainability, uh, what that means? Well, I can give you a practical example of what, uh, what Nesta is doing. So not a, uh, last year, uh, in 2019, we helped our customers reduce CO2 emissions by 9.6 million tons. That, that, that's, that's a concrete result. Uh, Nesta as a company has not only um, committed to moving ahead in decarbonizing faster than regulation, 
in Europe, but also we've set ourselves the ambitious target of being uh, carbon neutral by 2035 across all of our businesses. So imagining that today we still have two fossil refineries, we want to get to carbon neutral by 2035. That is a huge commitment. And I think, and I honestly believe that is, that is something that Neste can achieve. So if we can do that, and we can in continue to increase the amount of renewable products that we can bring to our customers to help reduce carbon, yes, we can do this as a society, but it is a choice that we need to have. And that's why I think, again, when, when, uh, when we're fighting our way out of this crisis, this is also the time to have a clear policy that our, that our, that our politicians, that our governments, federal, state, local, that they start working and deciding what kind of future do we want to have. They are, there are some very good policies out there. Uh, California has a low carbon fuel standard. Oregon has a clean fuel program. Washington uh, state has, has been um, voting to implement a program such as that as well. So I think the, the opportunity is there for sustainable, clean recovery. And Jeremy, I think that you're hitting at a point here when we talk about innovation, it's so important to include, and that's innovations in policy. And that's getting smart policy. And I would suggest that we could draw a lot of inspiration from a Nordic context also with respect to this and examples in the world um, about smart policy. And perhaps that's how we need to frame it also, rather than talking about, particularly in an American context, talking about regulation, which is inherently seen as bad, smart policy. And it seems that you offer some really good examples of smart policy that we could drive. Conrad, we have just a moment left in our panel. Do you have any parting words of wisdom that you could share with us very briefly? Well, you should remember that it's uh, the decision makers. And in this case, for the companies, the customers who will decide what to buy. And uh, they are definitely not going to shoot themselves in the foot. They're going to go sustainable because that is the future. We all have to do that. Excellent words to conclude by here, Conrad. Uh, I, it's such a privilege, uh, Jeremy, Conrad, John, to be able to learn from you, from your experiences and the experiences of your respective organizations on going from brown to green. Thank you so very much uh, for sharing your insights. Thanks, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.